Welcome to Utah State University's Vertebrate Paleontology course. My name is Benjamin Berger. In this lecture, we will examine how paleontologists can study the function behind the morphology of extinct vertebrates. Functional morphology is the interpretation of the function of a particular shape and form of an animal. There are two fundamental ways in which we can study functional morphology. First, by making comparisons to living animals and utilizing something called the extant phylogenetic bracket concept. The second way is the use of mechanical models and our knowledge of physics and apply that to the understanding of the function of key morphologies in vertebrates. All right, so let's look at some examples. Have you ever noticed how aquatic vertebrates such as fish, dolphins, and even extinct marine reptiles like ichthyosaurs, they look kind of similar. They're all sort of oval in shape. Could there be some functional reason for this similarity. Now we could construct a mechanical model to test different shapes and see how easily that shape moves through the water. One such example is using a CD or DVD. We notice that when the CD is placed perpendicular to the direction of flow, the fluid generates considerable turbulence and the amount of drag forces are maximized. If we place the CD so that the thin side faces the current, the amount of turbulence and drag is minimized and it moves more easily through the water. In physics, we can define something called shear. Shear is the ease with which adjacent layers of liquid slip past one another. As a liquid passes across a surface, it slows down causing layers above the surface within the liquid to slow as well, and hence produces shear. The effective layer of fluid is called a, the boundary layer, which varies due to the viscosity of the liquid. Now in physics, we can define a way to measure this effect called Reynolds number. Now Reynolds number is a dimensionless number um, defined as the length multiplied by the speed, multiplied by the density of the liquid, divided by the viscosity. So for example, if we look at an ichthyosaur that is two meters long and use the standard density of water and a speed estimated at 11 miles per hour, divided by the viscosity, we get a very large Reynolds number of 7.7 .7 million. However, if we look at a guppy, a little fish, the length and speed are much less, and this produces a much smaller Reynolds number of 383. These low Reynolds numbers mean that the viscous forces dominate with the greatest drag caused by friction. So the guppy does not need to be as streamlined but it does need to worry about friction and changes in viscosity of the liquid it swims in. For example, the guppy would not be able to swim through honey where ichthyosaur might be able to swim through that honey. With high Reynolds numbers, pressure drag forces dominate and the viscosity is a minor, of a minor importance. In this case, the animal would be better to minimize the pressure drag by becoming more rounded and oval shaped. Lots of experiments in labs have shown that the most streamlined shape is an object that has the widest part placed between about one third and one half of the way back from the front. This shape minimizes the total pressure drag. If we compare this ideal shape with that of larger aquatic vertebrates, we see that they all are trying to minimize the drag by taking on this similar shape. Now we can contrast this to the tiny little diatom at the bottom there, which is shaped like a CD. It deviates the, from the sh streamlined shape because it's so small 
is subjected instead to viscosity changes and friction. Tiny animals living in the water can exhibit a wider diversity of shapes. The effect that size plays on the functional morphology of an animal is referred to as allometry. The study of the relationships between body size and shape. When we look at fish, we can see how fins are used in a brilliant way for the animal to navigate and turn in the water by controlling the pressure drag as it swims. A similar system is used in boats that navigate with a rudder. The dorsal and anal fins allow the fish to turn, called yaw. The pitch is controlled by the pelvic and pectoral fins, which lift or drop the fish's position. Rolls are done by changing the position of the left and right pectoral and pelvic fins, with the aid of the dorsal and anal fins to stabilize. The forward movement of the fish is done by using all the muscles down the length of the body, as well as its broad tail. We see with the primitive chordates that dorsal and anal fins allow these primitive fish to turn for the first time, and that the body muscle segments are used for the major propulsive forward movement in these very primitive fish-like animals. Let's now talk about another method for studying functional morphology, the extant phylogenetic bracket method. The extant phylogenetic bracket follows that if two living organisms which bracket the phylogenetic relationships of a fossil group, a trait common to both living groups is likely have been present in the fossil group. This extant phylogenetic bracket method is often used in the study of dinosaurs. If a trait is found in both birds and crocodiles, then it's assumed that it was likely present as well in dinosaurs. In 2002, Matt Carano and John Hutchinson used this method to study the hind limb muscles of Tyrannosaurus rex. They observed that some muscles are found in only birds, while others are found in both crocodiles and birds, and still others are found only in crocodiles. Now the biggest difference between T. rex and a crocodile is that T. rex runs on two legs, while the biggest difference between T. rex and birds is that birds lack a tail. The researchers were able to map out muscles in common with living animals, giving a better picture of the muscles found in a T. rex. T. rex shares with crocodiles in having a large muscle called the caudal femoris longus, which runs between the tail and the femur, the thigh bone. T. rex shares with birds in having a muscle called the iliotrochanterechus caudus, clod caudus, which is absent in crocodiles. They assumed that both muscles, in fact, were present in Tyrannosaurus rex by comparison of the living animals that most closely are related to dinosaurs. In this way, they could map out the muscles of an extinct animal. Let's look at one other additional study of functional morphology. A question that often comes up is, how fast were these extinct animals? We can study modern mammals today and record as best we can their top speeds and how much they weigh, their body size. If we look at this graph here, we can see that small animals tend to be slower, as well as the largest mammals. We see a drop off in the speeds as you get up to the size of a rhino. And this kind of makes sense given what we know about running. Now we need to look at something that we can measure in the fossil record that can be used as a proxy to determine how fast these extinct animals ran. In this paper by Garland and Janus in 1993, they looked at the ratio between the metatarsal bone in the foot and the femur in the thigh. It has been observed that a longer metatarsal bone 
coupled with a shorter femur is found in the fastest running animals. If we plot both body size and our new ratio between the femur and the metatarsals, we get a similar graft for living mammals. Hence, we can use this index as a way to estimate the speed of extinct animals. But if we use this method, we need to be careful. For example, look how far out there the giraffe is, yet its known running speed would place it more modestly as slightly faster than camels. This method may overestimate the speed of long-legged animals. So there are some limits in our understanding of what extinct animals could have been able to do when they lived. All right, you should now be able to justify how paleontologists can study the functional morphology of extinct vertebrates, either by comparing them to living vertebrates or by using mechanical models. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about Utah State University's geology program, check out the website geology.usu.edu or my own website at benjamin Links are found in the descriptions below.